and Orbiting Human Circus Special, The Second Imaginary Symphony. Thanks to Audible for supporting The Second Imaginary Symphony. For a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial, go to audible.com OHC. And thanks to our sponsor, Merge Records, the North Carolina label that has been putting out independent music since 1989. Check out the janitor songs from the first season of the Orbiting Human Circus of the Air, available digitally now and coming soon as a very special limited edition 10-inch. Learn more about the music tapes, Neutral Milk Hotel, and other musical projects featuring Julian Coster at MergeRecords.com. And to get 20% off anything at MergeRecords.com, enter code OHC at checkout. This episode will be the narrative finale of the Second Imaginary Symphony, but stay tuned for one more special episode to come on July 5th. Send your questions about the Second Imaginary Symphony or the Orbiting Human Circus to podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com, and we'll choose a few to answer as part of that episode. And now, episode four. You are listening to the Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation. It's Platypus Eve. I cannot begin to describe our Platypus Eve festivities. I can only tell you that it is one of the most lovely evenings of the year. And that it begins with all of Paris listening to the final broadcast of the Second Imaginary Symphony. And ladies and gentlemen, the moment has come. This is Augie Plum. But let us first take a moment to discover for ourselves the difference between the sound of a sunrise on Telegraph Road as we experienced at the beginning of our adventure, and the sound of a sunrise on the streets of a sleepless city, as the first rays of morning light glitter peacefully upon the empty silver flask in Mr. Ackerman's outstretched hand. Nigh, said Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman, said Nye, who rubbed his eyes, for a moment not quite sure at all of where he was. Mr. Ackerman, you're all right, you're all right, he cried. Cringing at the volume of the excited boy's voice, Mr. Ackerman squinted at Nye. I'm fine, Nye, fine. What, what are you doing here? I was looking for you said Nye. Looking for me, repeated Mr. Ackerman. Does your grandmother know you're here? Nye shook his head. Oh, Nye, said Mr. Ackerman. She must be so worried. Watching Mr. Ackerman squint, it occurred to Nye that the early morning sun was hurting the cloudmaker's eyes. He carefully retrieved Mr. Ackerman's hat and handed it to him. Mr. Ackerman thanked Nye, but did not put it on, instead returning it to the ground, where it had been. How in the world did you find me, Nye? He asked. Excitedly, Nye began to recount the previous day's events. As Nye spoke, the look of sadness that had taken hold of Mr. Ackerman's face began to deepen, and from time to time, he simply shook his head finally seeming as though he could listen to no more. Mr. Ackerman righted himself and silenced Nye with a wave of his swollen right hand. Please, Nye, please, he said, seemingly quite lost in thought. There passed a moment of silence between the two. The excitement Nye had felt in recounting his story quickly faded and was replaced instead with a creeping feeling of dread. <laughs> 
Mr. Ackerman was right. His grandmother was surely sick with worry. And with his previous day's adventures, Mr. Ackerman seemed none too pleased. In fact, looking at Mr. Ackerman just then, it seemed that he too might be sick. Though maybe not with worry. Nye felt the question he had been dying to ask since he awoke bubbling up. What happened to you, Mr. Ackerman? Mr. Ackerman looked at Nye, and for a moment appeared to be at a loss for an answer. Nye watched as Mr. Ackerman's gaze first fell upon his shoes, and then to the ground beneath them. Nothing happened to me, Nye, Mr. Ackerman said finally. Nothing happens to me. The boy looked up at him expectantly, waiting. I just left. Mr. Ackerman looked at Nye. I got fed up and left. You'll understand when you grow up. But the cloud makers, they need you. Mr. Ackerman looked down at the little boy before him and shook his head. We've got to get you home now, was all Mr. Ackerman said. But Nye did not follow. He stood in place and looked up at Mr. Ackerman, clearly not understanding. Seeing this, Mr. Ackerman looked suddenly quite ashamed and stopped. He turned back towards Nye and feeling for the flask in his jacket pocket, quietly spoke. I, Mr. Ackerman said, am not a cloud maker. At this, Nye found his head swimming and a great sob escaped from somewhere deep within him. After all the strange and scary things he had experienced in the past 24 hours, it seemed he had found himself at last beginning to cry. Nye could not understand why after all he had done, Mr. Ackerman would no longer trust him with his secret. And it was the thought that he had somehow lost this trust that he could not bear. His face red with shame. Mr. Ackerman took the crying boy into his arms, and had Nye's face not been buried in the lining of his jacket, Nye would have noticed that at that moment Mr. Ackerman looked very, very old. Mr. Ackerman felt very much as if he should say something, but was at a bit of a loss as to what that something should be. There are cloud makers, he offered, and the boy looked up. I believe with all my heart that there are cloud makers. Why, just look up at the sky, he said, pointing upwards. What more proof could you need? As Nye's tears began to abate, Mr. Ackerman put a firm hand on the boy's shoulder and knelt down so as to look him directly in the eye. It's just that I, he said, Rudolph Abacus Ackerman, am not one of them. I'm a widget maker. That factory, Nye, it's a widget factory. That's all it's ever been. We make widgets there. Three-pronged, one-slot widgets. I didn't want to tell you, Nye. I didn't want to tell you because I'm not proud of it. I don't even like widgets. Looking down at Nye, Mr. Ackerman suddenly realized that the boy did not believe him. Look at my hands, Nye. They're worn. They swell up. It's from years of curing widgets, riveting rivets into slots, and molding metal prongs. There's no place in a cloud factory for a man like me. But Mr. Ackerman, I saw the cloud factory, pleaded Nye. There are no clouds in that factory, boomed Mr. Ackerman, who, surprised by the volume of his own voice, cringed and continued in a much quieter and apologetic tone. I wish there were, Nye. I wish to the heavens above that it were one of those factories. But in that factory, Nye, there's nothing at all but widgets. And that is why I must stay here and seek to once again fill my silver flask. And you, Nye, must be sent home to your grandmother this instant. But Mr. Ackerman, 
sobbed Nye. And then suddenly, Nye had an idea. He crawled over to Mr. Ackerman's briefcase and opened both it and the cold silver case within. What Mr. Ackerman saw then, he would remember for the rest of his life. A small, perfectly formed nimbus cloud, drifting slowly skyward out of the open recess of his briefcase. Mr. Ackerman stood up, and with his mouth hanging open, and a look of shock upon his face, moved towards the small cloud in order to examine it more closely. The cloud, however, continued to drift upwards and away from him, not for a moment taking his eyes away from the rising cloud. Mr. Ackerman continued in its pursuit, and Nye, taking Mr. Ackerman's hand, gently placed Mr. Ackerman's hat back upon his head, where it belonged. The two followed their cloud out of the narrow alleyway and down to the busy city street, where the busy city dwellers were far too busy to notice the spectacle of a nine-year-old boy and a disheveled man marching hand in hand behind a small nimbus cloud. The further along they went in pursuit of the cloud, the higher also it drifted. Mr. Ackerman never for a moment took his gaze away from the cloud, like a man hypnotized. And when Nye finally did, he found that things were once again beginning to look familiar. The cloud, it seemed, was leading them home. The boy and the man, hand in hand, followed the cloud from street to street, over grassy fields, steep hills, and deepened valleys, until the cloud had reached such an elevation that it was no longer distinguishable from the other clouds that filled the sky around it. It was at this point that Mr. Ackerman looked downwards from the sky and found himself at the gate of the great factory. The guard at the gate smiled warmly and beckoned for both Nye and Mr. Ackerman to come in. But Mr. Ackerman hesitated. He was no longer sure of what awaited him and the little boy inside and was suddenly quite afraid. I'm just an ordinary man, he said backing away. The guard put a reassuring hand on Mr. Ackerman's shoulder and led him through the open factory gate. Now flanked on either side by the guard and the little boy who was still holding his hand, Mr. Ackerman began to walk tentatively forward, and the awkward threesome soon made their way to the huge double doors that marked the factory's entrance. Sweating profusely, Mr. Ackerman took a deep breath, and before he could protest, watched as the guard unlatched the giant latch and pushed the huge factory doors wide open. What Mr. Rudolph Abacus Ackerman saw then was at once the most amazing and beautiful thing that he had ever seen. Rows of singing white-haired women sitting on a vast and spiraling assembly line. In front of each, a small and perfectly formed cloud floating only inches above a frost-covered silver tray. Men cranking cranks and pulling levers upon huge machines made of silver and bronze. Hundreds of workers suspended in midair by string, pulleys and wire, pedaling upon small contraptions whose pedals and gears were linked to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears, and those to bigger gears yet. Above them, giant fans blowing the larger completed clouds toward smokestacks high along the factory's vast lighted ceiling, creating huge cloud-shaped shadows that drifted over the men and women working a hundred feet below. He saw several raised platforms upon which sat workers surrounded by huge control panels of blinking and flashing lights, buttons and knobs of every imaginable size and color, frost-covered golden tubs housing hundreds of tiny floating clocks waiting for inspection. Suspended from the ceiling, a giant clock of a sort that he had never seen before, flanked on all sides by a towering bank of gauges and meters. And rising out of it all, on the tallest platform yet, he saw the elder cloudmaker, who from his perch high above, directed the flow of the entire factory, 
with graceful waves of his left hand while calling out through the megaphone in his right. Nimbus, 200 of 3,000. Stratus, 44 of 53. Cumulus, 27 of 413. And on and on. Nigh tugging at his sleeve, Mr. Ackerman entered the cloud factory, and the whole of the cloud makers, in their hundreds, turned to face him. On his platform high above, the elder cloud maker stopped conducting for a moment and smiled. They took Mr. Ackerman's jacket and hat and led him up the very steps of the platform that Nye had visited the day before and so delivered him to the chair upon which his name was engraved. As the look of astonishment on Mr. Ackerman's face began slowly to turn to a smile, I realized that he had never truly seen Mr. Ackerman smile before. And now, as his misty eyes gratefully surveyed the hundreds of cloud makers in his midst, Nye saw a single drop of moisture fall upon Mr. Ackerman's cheek. Now whether this was a drop of precipitation from one of the great clouds above, or a single tear of his own, he could hardly guess as Rudolph Abacus Ackerman smiled the biggest smile that Nye had ever seen and began silently to work.
known to our sponsor Merge Records, the North Carolina label that has been putting out independent music since 1989. Recent releases include records from The Mountain Goats, BBO Sound Machine, and Coco Hames. Available for pre-order now are new albums by Waxahachie, A Giant Dog, Mike Kroll, and The Clientele. To learn more, visit MergeRecords.com, and of course, check out the janitor songs from the first season of The Orbiting Human Circus of the Air, now available as a digital EP and coming soon as a special limited edition 10-inch. To get 20% off your purchase at MergeRecords.com, enter code OHC at checkout. That's 20% off with OHC at MergeRecords.com. And thanks again to Audible for helping bring the Second Imaginary Symphony to you. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. And audiobooks are great to listen to when you're questioning the nature of reality. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. Just go to audible.com OHC. I've been listening to The Lonely Hearts Hotel by Heather O'Neill, a love story about two orphans with an unshakable childhood dream following them as they grow into brilliantly talented performers caught in 1930s Montreal's CD underworld. To listen to this book or anything else from Audible, go to audible.com slash OHC for a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. That's audible.com slash OHC. And finally, send your questions about the Second Imaginary Symphony or the Orbiting Human Circus to podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com, and we'll choose some to answer in Episode 5. The Second Imaginary Symphony is written, directed, and audio produced by Julian Coster, performed by Brian Dewan, and produced for podcasting by Christy Gressman. With Augustus Plum as himself, Second Imaginary Symphony music by Julian Coster and the Music Tapes, and Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation music by Thomas Hughes. For more information, go to orbitinghumancircus.com. The Orbiting Human Circus is part of the Nightvale Presents Network. To learn more, go to nightvalepresents.com.